MMA requires regulation, more so probably than any other sport in existence. This isn't throwing balls into a hoop. This isn't synchronized ice dancing. If mixed martial arts were to go to its logical conclusion, the results would be less than legal. And thus, governing bodies like the State Athletic Commissions and USADA have been formed and hired to keep the sport within the bounds of sport, both inside and outside the cage. But these regulating bodies aren't always met with smiling faces and appreciation, especially from fighters who've been met with violations or wrongdoings that must face them. And today we're going to take a look at the nastiest, the biggest, and the worst clashes between the athletes and those charged with keeping them in line. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are the 10 biggest fighter versus commission feuds. Number 10, Nick Diaz versus Quebec. There were quite a few issues that Nick Diaz and his team had with his welterweight title fight against George St. Pierre at UFC 158. The camp claimed Diaz's travel arrangements and schedule for the week were altered to put him in a less than ideal state. Nick has claimed that he was poisoned on fight week. The team also said that GSP may have had spies in their camp. Another issue raised was the belief that St. Pierre was on steroids. Oh, uh, sure, yeah. I believe that he's, on, that he's on plenty of steroids. I don't think they test around here either. I doubt I'll be tested. And was inappropriately drug tested post fight, that there was something suspicious about GSP's hand wraps. This guy has no punching power. No offense. I'm sorry. You're a wrestler. But something hit me right here and I didn't wind up with a cut. But not that. I don't know. That's J. J he said he had an issue with his wraps. Maybe he has something wrong with his wraps. I don't know. That he was allowed to miss weight by the Quebec Commission. That last one. Well, not saying it's true, but at least Nick had some video evidence. The day before the weigh-ins, both GSP and Diaz were informed that unlike every other title fight in UFC history, the fighters didn't have to be exactly championship weight. They could be up to 0.9 pounds over and still compete for the title. Diaz's camp captured a video of the UFC's vice president informing them of the situation that he said only applied to that night's title fight. He even used the phrase off the record. The video was uploaded to YouTube and then given a DMCA notice by the UFC. However, there are now versions of it online today. Diaz Diaz weighed in at 169 pounds, so whether it was rounded down or not, he was 100% under the championship limit. St. Pierre was announced as 170, but was it rounded down? GSP told a Canadian outlet sometime after the card he was surprised by the rule and he could have weighed 170.4, but he doesn't remember. Diaz's team released the video previously mentioned and text messages with officials to support their claims publicly before filing a formal complaint with the commission requesting GSP be stripped of his title and a rematch be given. In the end, though, and despite the seeming intrigue of the video, Quebec's rules about only counting the first three numbers on the scale and disregarding anything after were found to be consistently done across the board in both boxing and MMA events previous. So there was really nothing out of the ordinary. Diaz claimed GSP missed by three pounds, but there's no evidence to support he was given anything more than the rounding of his decimals. Oh, Canada. Number nine, Chris Cyborg versus USADA. In 2015, the UFC partnered with the United States Anti-Doping Agency in order to clean up the sport, or at the very least, clean up the perception that the sport was dirty and filled with cheating cheaters. The move was met with praise initially, and USADA really got after their anti-doping program, testing the hell out of the UFC roster and catching all sorts of fighters taking performance enhancers. But as we'll see on this list, they don't always hit the mark, or in this instance, they decided to make an exception. Chris Cyborg has had looming doubt about how clean an athlete she is since the start of her career, but the failed test for steroids in 2011 definitely didn't help, which is why when in December of 2016, when USADA announced that Cyborg had tested positive for spironolactone, a prohibited diuretic, there were more than a few in the MMA community who were ready to shout, I told you so. I knew it. Not so fast though. After the initial failure, Cyborg provided USADA with extensive documentation about her medical history, as well as what her doctors had prescribed her. And Chris made the argument that everything she was taking was on the level and super necessary due to the effects of her insane weight cuts. After looking through all of the materials, USADA changed their ruling and granted Cyborg a retroactive therapeutic use exemption for the banned substance, meaning that her previous usage was now okay and there would be no suspension given. Now, Chris could have asked for the exemption before she got in trouble, but as USADA explained, retroactive exemptions are allowed within their guidelines if sufficient evidence was presented. Cyborg is one of only a few to get through her ordeal with USADA in a relatively short amount of time and with full acknowledgement that there was no wrongdoing. Some other fighters on this list won't be so lucky. Number eight, 
Frank Mir and Tom Lawler vs. USADA When John Jones was allowed by the UFC to fight in California at UFC 232 in 2018, despite trace amounts of metabolites from the banned substance Terenabol showing up in his system, it required a lot of explaining by officials to get the media and fans to understand that the measurement picograms are like a million pieces of a grain of sand, and that the drugs were just pulsing back into John's system from a previous failure in 2017, so they in absolutely no way could help his performance, granted that he only had 40 picograms grams or so of the Terenabol metabolite in his body. A hard sell, no doubt. In the quiet words of the Virgin Mary, come again. But an absolutely mind-blowing admission to two fighters in particular, Frank Mir and Tom Lawler. Lawler had been suspended for two years in 2016 for having the performance enhancer Osterine in his system. He was subsequently cut from the UFC before the suspension had ended. Mir failed a USADA test in 2016 for the same drug as Jones, Terenabol, and received a two-year suspension as well as his requested release from the UFC. But here's where things get tricky. Lawler had only 17 picograms of his drug in his system, an amount according to what the UFC had said about John Jones could not possibly enhance his performance, and Mir's failure had nearly the same level of picograms as Jones from the same drug, but USADA told him there was no way he hadn't recently ingested the substance. Despite their later conclusions in the Jones case, that the metabolites were merely pulsing back into existence from a previous failure. So did USADA gain some new understanding about their testing, or were exceptions being made for Jones by the UFC because of his high profile? And if it's the former, why aren't some of these earlier cases then revisited? In USADA and the UFC defense, if they believed their conclusion that Jones had not re-ingested the drug, then it would make sense that Mir and Lawler were punished, granted the drugs were discovered for the first time in their systems. But that doesn't take into account the fact that such an emphasis was put on how little that trace amount could actually enhance performance. Both fighters have since moved on to other organizations, but Mir has considered taking legal action against USADA and the UFC. Number 7. Habib Nurmagomedov versus Nevada. After Habib Nurmagomedov defeated Conor McGregor to defend his UFC lightweight title at UFC 229, he and the boys got into a little bit of a melee, and wouldn't you know it, the Nevada State Athletic Commission was not a fan of fighters beating the hell out of each other after the event in the middle of the arena. The thing about these state commissions, though, is that they tend to rule on these types of situations in a bit of a haphazard way. At the end of the hearing, a commissioner suggests a punishment, and then they all vote on it. In the case of Habib Nurmagomedov and his friends, Nevada wanted to make it abundantly clear that shenanigans were not to be allowed in Sin City. Firstly, half of Habib's $2 million purse was withheld until the hearings could be resolved. Once they were, Nevada hit the Eagle with a nine-month suspension, which I would say actually is pretty fair. The $500,000 fine, though, This is number one bullshit. In addition to taking that huge chunk of his purse, two of Habib's teammates were suspended for a full year, prompting Habib to declare that he would no longer be fighting in Nevada. Way to stick it to him. When Insac presented Nurmagomedov with the opportunity to reduce his suspension by participating participating in a PSA, Habib hilariously replied, The state of Nevada is where drugs, prostitution, and gambling are officially permitted. Let them work on themselves. What a statement. Connor and his team were also doled out punishments for the brawl, but Habib most definitely got the brunt of Nevada's wrath, which he took in stride, never appealing the decision. Number 6. BJ Penn vs. Nevada that GSP is up to it again, but this time there might be a little bit more substance to the claims. A slippery substance. The rematch between George St. Pierre and BJ Penn at UFC 94 had the same outcome as their previous outing, a victory for GSP, but this time around the fight would go on well after they left the cage. Two days after the event, BJ Penn informed the media that he would be filing a formal complaint with the Nevada State Athletic Commission against St. Pierre, accusing the welterweight champion of greasing during their rematch between rounds one, two, and three. Phil Nurse, one of GSP's corner, was was applying Vaseline to the champion's face between rounds, a common practice, but he was then using that same hand to rub down GSP's shoulders and back area. At the hearing, INSAC director Keith Kaiser confirmed that the actions had taken place and he observed them on the night of the fight, but he also stated that he then had GSP wiped down after each application before the round started. St. Pierre and company feigned ignorance, saying it was entirely accidental if any of the Vaseline got on George's back between rounds. They were simply going about their business of getting George ready for the next next five minutes and didn't realize what they were doing. Despite Penn's team presenting a 20-page case outlining everything they claimed proved the greasing and requesting a $250,000 fine for all parties involved, as well as a suspension for GSP and a no-contest ruling on the bout, the commission ultimately ruled that the fight would stand, nobody would be suspended, and not a dime was to be paid. In the end, though, Penn was able to make some changes. The UFC subsequently changed their corner policies after the event, and team members were no longer allowed to apply Vaseline 
only UFC cutmen who would now be assigned to each fighter's corner between rounds. Given that the commission was wiping GSP down after the applications anyway, it's hard to say that this could have affected the outcome of the fight. The only question is whether it was intentional, but that's just something we'll never know because it's their word versus Pence. Number 5. Nick Diaz versus Nevada in case you hadn't noticed, Nick Diaz is not exactly what I would call a fan of authority. You might say he's the exact opposite, and when you have situations like Nick's various issues with the state of Nevada, it's easy to see why. Stockton's first son found himself on the receiving end of a five-year suspension and a $165,000 fine by the state of Nevada due to a failed post-fight drug test after his bout with Anderson Silva at UFC 183. What did the commission find in that test? Steroids? EPO? Super steroids? Nope, they found some marijuana material metabolites. Oh, the horror. Now, this was Nick's third such issue in the state. He popped after UFC 143 for marijuana and was suspended for a year. And after his fight with Takanori Gomi in that one pride event that was held in Nevada, he got suspended for six months and the fight was overturned to a no contest because commission chair Tony Alamo believed that the pot in Diaz's system numbed him to the pain and helped him win. Holy shit. Look, I get it, there's rules and they need to be followed, even if it's just about weed. But the escalation of Diaz's penalties for these minor infractions are excessive. And Nevada eventually agreed with me. After Diaz fought his post-UFC 183 ruling in an appeal hearing, he had his fine reduced to $100,000, still way too much, and his suspension reduced to 18 months, which is still ridiculous, but better than five years. Unsurprisingly, Diaz has not fought since the incident, and who would blame him? Number four, Vitor Belfort versus Nevada. Throughout the years, fighters have chosen all sorts of different methods to try to get out of punishment from the commissions for failed drug tests. They might claim their supplements were tainted, or that they didn't know the substance was banned when they took it, but they really should have just tried crying. Crying worked out really well for Vitor Belfort. In February of 2014, Vitor was just wrecking the middleweight division and looking like Godzilla, which raised some suspicion. But he wasn't cheating, he just needed TRT for his low testosterone, you see. During his rampage that set up a title fight against Chris Weidman in May, Belfort was fighting exclusively in Brazil, and many began to wonder why he hadn't fought in Vegas since 2011. When the Phenom headed to Sin City for the World MMA Awards since he was nominated for Fighter of the Year, Nevada surprised him and asked if he could piss in a cup. He could, but he failed. Belfort's testosterone levels were higher than the amount allowed, despite his medical need for TRT. Three weeks later, the commission would ban TRT usage outright, forcing Belfort to cancel that whole title fight thing for a bit and get off the legal juice. This created another problem for Vitor. That rescheduled title fight would be taking place in Las Vegas, and he needed to get licensed by the commission that just banned TRT because of him and found that he had elevated testosterone levels. In a hearing that could have completely derailed his career, Career, Belfort broke down crying in his opening statement with an argument that was essentially, I had an exemption in Brazil, and I had just taken TRT before you guys gave me that test, that's why my levels were so high, and I won't ever do anything wrong again. Nevada loved it, and didn't even consider anything about Vitor's past, or that the TRT system may have been abused. Nope, they granted Belfort the license under a few minor conditions, and then ended the hearing by telling Vitor he was their new best friend. I'm not kidding, a commissioner actually said that to Vitor. Number 3. Chael Sonnen vs. California and Nevada there may be bigger winners against the MMA world's governing bodies, as we'll get into in our next entry, but nobody worked the commissions quite like Chael Sonnen. Chael's first run-in with the MMA law came in the state of California after his first loss to Anderson Silva at UFC 117 in 2010. Sonnen's post-fight piss test revealed that his TE ratio was 16.9 to 1. That's over four times what is allowed. It was an open and shut case. Sonnen got a year and a $2,500 fine. Not so fast, though. Sonnen immediately appealed and went with the medical team. TRT exemption defense. The only problem was he hadn't applied for an exemption in California, but Chael said that was because he talked to Commissioner Keith Kaiser in Nevada about it, so he figured once you told Nevada, you were good to go anywhere. The California Commission felt that was reasonable and reduced Chael's suspension from a year to six months. Not so fast, though. Keith Kaiser said he never talked to Chael about TRT. When confronted by Keith on it, Chael said, I meant to say that you talked to my manager. But even so, Kaiser claimed it was only a conversation and not the process of applying for the exemption. CSAC looked into it, and it turned out Chael didn't have an exemption anywhere. So they reversed their suspension reduction and kept him indefinitely suspended until another hearing for his misleading testimony, as well as a conviction earlier that year over money laundering in Oregon. 
After it was all said and done though, all Chael got was a year, and then he was back at it again until his next run-in with a commission, this time Nevada in 2014, before he was to fight Vanderlei Silva at UFC 175. Chael failed a random drug test, and then another random drug test shortly thereafter. Not again, man. Is that possible? And between the two had everything in his system you can think of that's been banned. HGH, EPO, HCG. In total, there were five substances found, of which Sonnen refuted none. He later joked he was glad they only caught him with those drugs and not everything else he was doing. At any rate, you would assume, given his history and the amount of performance enhancers in his body, that Chael was pretty much done for. He had already announced his retirement and been fired from his job with the UFC as well as Fox Sports. So Nevada placing the lifetime ban hammer on the bad guy seemed inevitable. But this charming bastard came into the hearing and said, look, I did it, I did it to cheat, I'm sorry. By the end of the hearing, it was decided that Chael would only face two years for his indiscretions, and not only that, but he was offered a job with the commission to help educate them and other fighters on PEDs. There is nobody like the bad guy. Number two, Yoel Romero versus USADA. It seems like the most popular defense after a failed drug test is that there must have been some sort of tainted supplement that had the banned substance in it. It's often met with a bit of skepticism by fans and media, but in the case of Yoel Romero, not only was he able to clear his name, he made a fortune in the process. In January of 2016, USADA informed Yoel Romero that he had potentially failed an out-of-competition test and would be suspended for two years. The Cuban fighter and his team immediately refuted the claim and got to work on their defense. After doing some of their own investigating, they determined determined that it was a tainted supplement which featured the banned growth hormone release simulator in it, despite it not being labeled on the packaging. USADA ran their own tests on the product and determined as well that the banned substance was in fact in this supplement, despite it not being listed on the label. At that point, USADA was willing to bump the suspension down to nine months, since Yoel should have done the due diligence on the product he chose to consume. But Yoel was like, nope, fuck that, we're going to arbitration. And the arbiter determined that six months was more reasonable. Yoel fought USADA and won, for the most part. But he wasn't done yet, oh no. Romero and team filed a lawsuit against the company that made the Dirty Suppies Gold Star Performance product, and the state of New Jersey awarded God Soldier with $27 million. Money he'll sadly probably mostly never see, since companies have all kinds of ways of getting out of these types of things. In principle though, he's a winner. Number one. Vanderlei Silva versus Nevada. Our final entry shows how truly far both fighters and regulators can go. In early 2014, Vanderlei Silva was met with a representative from the Nevada State Athletic Commission for a random drug test while preparing for his upcoming bout at UFC 175 with Chael Sonnen. Yes, that exact same bout that Chael got in trouble for. The random tests were a newer NSAC policy, and Silva had been using banned diuretics to deal with the inflammation from a broken hand he suffered in a scuffle with Sonnen while filming Tough Brazil. So Silva ignored the request and left the gym. He just didn't take the test. He wasn't sure about the rep, although who the hell else would come there and take your pee? He knew he had banned substances in his system, so he just said, no regulating today. A bold and unprecedented decision that Silva probably never thought in his wildest dreams would lead to a career death sentence. But that is exactly what happened. At a hearing in September, Nevada banned Silva for life and levied a fine of $70,000 for skirting the drug exam. Both sides had played the game about as hard as it could be played, but Vandy wasn't done, and a year later he would come out on top when a judge ruled that Nevada had overstepped their authority and would need to have a rehearing. Since Silva hadn't actually earned a purse since the fight didn't happen, the commission dropped the 70k fine. Vandy's off to a good start. They also settled on a three-year ban for avoiding the test. But Vandy was not done defying the commission yet. While still actively suspended, Silva was wheeling and dealing with Ryzen to fight in Japan, a place that didn't care about the commission's ruling. Other states will always uphold another commission's suspensions, but places like Japan and Ryzen Russia are the Wild West, they do not care. The only problem was that Vandy was still under UFC contract, which he tried to get out of by claiming that he could prove the UFC fixed fights. Silva's strategy here was full scorched earth just burn everything to the ground. Unbelievably though, Vandy apologized for the fight-fixing accusations, and shockingly, the UFC let him go to do whatever he wished, and he wished to fight while he was suspended by Nevada. But the various rise and bouts he was attached to all fell apart, and Vandy would only return to the cage in 2017 after his suspension to fight Chael Sonnen finally. He lost. 
The implications of his actions, though, have led to subsequent fighters actually going to Japan after suspensions. Talk about a battle, there was no way this one wasn't going to be number one on our list. Huge shout out to the Pride of the West Midlands, Tom Moore, for putting his editing sorcery to work on this video. Follow him on Twitter at TomMJMoore. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day. Thanks so Thanks much so for, for watching, if there is anyone watching at all.